Vampires, vampires everywhere. More than 1,300 gathered to celebrate the 125th anniversary of Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula. This vampire tale was not an instant global success, but the genre really took flight when Count Dracula hit the silver screen. Today, vampires are a billion dollar business. Join us, if you dare, on a mission to find out how Dracula rejuvenates and grows ever stronger. <laughs> Irish writer Bram Stoker got inspiration for his classic story whilst holidaying in Whitby on England's northeast coast in the 1890s. In his novel, this is where Count Dracula lands in the Western world and in our nightmares. Today, the town is a place of pilgrimage for horror fans. Why the genre will never die? Reason number one, obsessive fans. It's a very good story. It's the romance of it all and that, and, mm. you know, and the consequences of, of love and deception. I suppose there's, there's the, the, the fight over good over evil. Two bats flew and we saw the bats against the moon with the abbey. And I thought, I know exactly how his imagination worked because he must have seen the same thing. Because well. it's spooky. <laughs> <laughs> there was a bright full moon with heavy black driving clouds which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade. Bram Stoker's novel Dracula was published on May 26, 1897. It's presented as a true story. Reason number two for the genre's enduring success, mixing fact and fiction. Professor Catherine Wynne has studied the elements that the Irish writer took from Whitby. He also did his research in Whitby Library, and it was there, of course, that he discovered the name Dracula. And he changes the name of his vampire from Count Wampir, which would never have worked really, it's very melodramatic, <laughs> to Count Dracula. Stoker read about Vlad Dracul, or Vlad the Impaler, a 15th century ruler of Wallachia and a national hero in Romania. He was almost certainly not a vampire, but did have a reputation for brutality, in particular for impaling prisoners. Although historians say the stories may well have been exaggerated or even invented. Stoker took the name for Dracula's first British victim from a gravestone in the cemetery of St Mary's Church. Bruce Wales. It's a great name though, isn't it? Um, yes. He finds, finds this name here and decides to use it, immortalise this figure in his, in his novel. The figure who introduces Lucy and Mina to, to all the tales of Whitby and is the first victim on British soil yeah. of the vampire. Of course, there are victims on the boat. In real life, that boat was the Russian schooner the Dimitri and was wrecked in a storm in 1885 on the beach below St Mary's Church. This true story also finds its way into the novel in slightly changed form. He changes the name of the boat, he doesn't do very much, he just changes the name of the boat from the Dimitri to the Demeter. The only living thing that bounds off this boat is a black dog, a huge hound. And he bounds up the steps here. This huge hound is Dracula. Stoker picked up on the local legend of the bar guest, the black dog ghost, and skillfully wove it into his elaborate tale. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang upon the deck from below as if shot up by the concussion and running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand. Vampire lore is much older than Stoker's novel. Belief in vampires was widespread in Southern and Eastern Europe in the 17th century, such that Pope Benedict XIV had to declare that vampires were fallacious fictions of human fantasy. 
By the early 18th century, vampires were beginning to colonise Western European novels like John Polidori's The Vampire, originally attributed to Lord Byron. Dr Claire Nally says Bram Stoker was clearly inspired by these earlier works. There are so many other um, vampire novels. Uh, Polidori's The Vampire predates Stoker's novel. Uh, we've also got Carmilla by Sheridan Lefanu. There's, there's quite a few um, examples. Carmilla by Sheridan Lefanu is really interesting because even though it's written in quite coded terms for the period. Uh, Carmilla is a lesbian vampire and um, obviously that links to an awful lot of the, the queer agenda that you tend to find in Gothic texts. Again, the fact that, that Gothic texts are about the, uh, the unconscious, about, um, about arguably the taboo. Which brings us to reason number three for the genre's enduring appeal, sex and sexuality. Vampire texts are always, on one level, about forbidden desires. Also, the descriptions in the novel are very overtly sexualized. There's lots of references to sort of um, uh, blood and, and her lips are dripping with blood, but she's wearing this white dress. So there's all these kind of reflections on innocence and virginity and... Um, all of those kinds of, yeah, broader ideas that will have been in, um, in, in kind of discourse in Victorian society. In 1922, the novel Dracula celebrated its 25th anniversary. Interest in the novel was waning, but it was about to get a major boost through reinvention for the silver screen. Nosferatu, directed by legendary German director F.W. Murnau, is ground zero for the vampire film. Reason four for the vampire genres rising from the grave, reinventing Dracula at the movies. F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu uh, was the first vampire movie, um, and it did set a template for a lot of those uh, to come, even though it's quite distinct. I mean, his vampire, his, his Count Orlok, is very different from the Draculas that will come later. But various elements uh, um, in terms of uh, the, the way that sunlight can kill a vampire. the way that uh, uh, Count Orlok lusts after young women and seizes them uh, at night, coming in through their bedroom windows. Um, those elements we see play out in a lot of other uh, vampire movies. It's visually so striking. I mean, it's done in this high German expressionist style with uh, extremely sharply contrasting shadows and, and light, and all, of course, done as, in, in, as a silent uh, film. So everything, the sort of visual elements play a much stronger role. Unfortunately, the makers of this historic horror film didn't bother obtaining the rights. They just changed the names. Dracula became Orlok, for example. Stoker's widow Florence successfully sued and in 1925 a court ordered the destruction of all copies. Fortunately for us, some survived. The first US film adaptation came in 1931. Actor Bela Lugosi was a Hungarian immigrant who had played the role in an authorised stage version. His acting and delivery may seem wooden to us today, but its chilling and haunting quality only added menace for audiences in the 1930s. I am Dracula. 
Well, what Bela Lugosi brought to Dracula, the character of Dracula, was Eastern European sophistication. You know, he, this is a guy, he was able to speak in beautiful, long, complicated sentences and incredibly charming and with that amazing Hungarian accent of, oh, I'm Count Dracula, I want to suck your blood. This was no longer just a, a monster uh, who wanted to kill innocent women. This was a sophisticated aristocrat who also wanted to kill innocent women. And that image of Dracula became a template for basically all the vampires to follow. Dracula slept through the 1940s and most of the 1950s. But on the cusp of the 1960s, a franchise was born. British actor Christopher Lee played the Count for the first time. Both the marketing and Lee's mesmerizing and simmering performance oozed sexuality. This is the story of Dracula a creature who destroys all whom he touches. What Christopher Lee brought to the character of Dracula was sex. He filled this character with erotic tension and, and, and lust. Uh, all these women, uh, bosom women, toppling over and fainting in front of Dracula as he consumes them. Um, and that sort of uh, sexual energy was something that we saw in vampires from then on uh, in, in cinema. Reason five for the vampire genre's recent revitalization, the female perspective. In Anne Rice's interview with the vampire, the bloodsuckers are driven by their nature to find new victims. But some have developed a conscience and feel quite bad about it. Anne Rice wrote interview with a vampire after the death of a child and this was her way of coming to terms with loss um, and of course I suppose the vampire had that type of appeal for her initially the sense of, of, of living forever which is one of the vampire's uh, great appeals. Rice's novels have many fans in the LGBTQ plus community. She creates this family of two male vampires uh, and a young girl, a, a child vampire. So what she creates for us in this, uh, quite radically in the 1970s and later filmed, of course, by Neil Jordan in the 1990s, is the gay family. In Stephanie Meyer's Twilight books and the films that followed, vampires are young and beautiful. Meyer writes from a Christian perspective. She's working within a very, uh, within a, a Mormon context as well, but it's about don't have sex before marriage. If the human female um, succumbs to the vampire, if Edward Cullen lets his defences down and, and takes her as a victim, uh, then she is, you know, she's going to become a vampire. And it's not what she looks like that's fascinating for Edward Cullen, it's how she smells. The sensation is so overwhelming for Edward when they first meet that Bella clearly believes she has a body odour problem. Reason six for the success of the genre is its basis in the dark arts. Nosferatu was co-produced by graphic designer Albin Grau, a student of the occult and lifelong member of Fraternitas Saturni under the name Master Pasitius. Grau influenced the look of the film and was responsible for the inclusion of alchemical symbols in a key scene. Orlock actor Max Schreck's depiction was so terrifying to 1920s audiences that here too, rumours abound. Some people uh, have claimed that he actually was a vampire, that he can't be buried here because he's, he's one of the undead. There's no way that could be an ordinary man. And also, I mean, Max Schreck? Come on, that sounds like a made-up name, right? Max, Max Fright? Come on, that can't be a real actor, right? I mean, come on. Do vampires really exist? Back in Whitby Bay, some fans of the genre would only agree to meet us after dark. My name is the Countess Dracula, and I'm the Count. Um, my name's Gary, but I'm known as um, Lucifer, Lucifer Dracula. Yeah, Definitely. we believe that vampires are real. I mean, we don't s sit around drinking blood all day long. Um, there are other other means of uh, satisfying our 
our mm. needs. There's nothing different really about us. There's lots of vampires in Whitby. Well, we're not sure about that, but 125 years after the publication of Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula has millions of fans all over the world. The vampire genre has revitalised itself, feeding on the blood of each new generation. Bram Stoker died in 1912, ten years before the first film. What would he have made of the enduring success of his creation? I think this is a wonderful celebration of Bram Stoker's legacy and the, the legacy of, of, of Dracula, because Stoker was a man of the theatre. He spent his whole life looking at costumes, seeing productions, gothic productions at the Lyceum Theatre. And what a celebration this is, this performance, these costumes, people living out their fantasies. The novel has had real traction in wider popular culture, and you can certainly see that around Whitby with all the tourist attractions, with shops that are inspired by Dracula, by Bram Stoker, and it's all that really that makes it, you know, so popular. Any theatre manager in their right mind would be very, very proud of a 125-year run of something that he created. And when you also think of being an artist, how he's inspired thousands of writers and stage directors, and of course, places like the Whitby Goth Festival that have profited from this, and is a, t a gathering of people that love to come and celebrate the goth life, things that Bram Stoker really introduced to the world way back in 1897. I'm feeling quite well. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who was the greatest screen Dracula of them all? Hmm. Bram Stoker's idea that vampires have no reflection seemed tailor-made for gripping scenes in countless films. But if we can't ask the mirror, let's ask the fans who their favourite Dracula was. I am going to have to go back to Universal Monsters, original black and white Dracula. Absolutely obsessed. <laughs> Lugosi is the, is the, in my opinion, the archetypal uh, Dracula. Um, only because I think his personal relationship to the character was unique to the fact he was a Hungarian Transylvanian uh, actor. Uh, he was a political refugee. Everyone knows what the ghosts mannerisms were and the cloak and the cravat and the and the accent. I've always been fascinated by by especially Christopher Lee. I th for, for me personally, he epitomizes Dracula. Max Schreck and Nosferatu uh, will stand as really um, one of the greatest horror films of all time, and I would say one of the greatest films of all time. What do you think? Which is your favourite story and film from the vampire genre? What is behind its phenomenal success? And who do you think is the greatest screen vampire? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button.